Welcome back. We're starting a new unit today. This is going to focus on mostly, you might think of the place part of the marketing mix. We're going to look at retailers and wholesalers, which are the people that uh, make things available to the final customers and wholesaling those who make uh, products available to, uh, to retailers and who kind of act as intermediaries. Um, in this video lecture, we're going to mostly look at kind of a classification of different types of retailers. Uh, for example, uh, ones that are different price points, uh, ones that offer a different uh, level of service, ones that have a different range of products, and all the ones that have a different mix of products in the same retailer. Um, and secondly, we're going to look at retail marketing decisions, which means why do retailers make cer certain decisions about to, uh, to reach their end customers in a particular way. In the next video lecture, we're going to look more at wholesaling, and we're going to look at some of the recent trends that have kind of been shaping uh, uh, retailing over the past uh, two decades with our roadmap. So the first thing, as I said, we're going to look at kind of a classification of different types of retailers. Uh, what are the different types of retail stores? Because uh, they, they range everything from big box stores, uh, large chains like Walmart, to convenience stores like 7-Eleven, um, and ones that are specialized on a particular product, ones that offer a variety of different products. Obviously, we can also include grocery stores in here. Um, and why do we have, let's say, this arrangement and this pattern of retailers? The second thing we're going to look at is why a retailer might choose a particular approach to retailing. Um, you know, whether they're mostly um, online, whether they're most a mix of online and uh, um, brick and mortar, um, whether they are focused only on brick and mortar. And it might be just in the sense of how they understand their business and how much contact they need with, um, uh, uh, with, with their uh, customers. Um, a good example of this um, is kind of the evolution of Starbucks, where Starbucks kind of started off being kind of a coffee shop where people would go in and socialize. And it was treated kind of like as a lounge where you could buy coffee and do other things, have access to cheap Wi-Fi and things of that sort. Uh, Starbucks has moved that most of its orders now are happening through an app and online where people order ahead, therefore more contactless than they were before. And they've kind of expanded and redesigned the, uh, their branches to be more about drive-through than about kind of come, come and sit in, spend time there. Um, and there are different reasons why Starbucks has, uh, has done that. Um, but the idea that's an example of how a retailer might uh, change their strategy and ch uh, evolve from one type of retailing to another. And lastly, how do these retailing decisions affect the success or failure uh, of marketing? Which means that uh, sometimes retailers uh, have made big mistakes about what they thought their customer uh, base was going to be, um, how to reach their customers. Um, probably the most famous examples of this is ones that kind of the anchor stores for, um, for malls such as Sears and JCPenney. Um, but uh, Sears and Kmart uh, have declined, while you've seen other retailers like uh, Walmart and Target uh, rise. Uh, Kohl's would be another good example. And why have some been successful and why have some failed and how that can be tied to their decisions about um, how to retail their, uh, how, how to organize themselves as retailers. So let's just start with a general definition of retailing. Uh, retailing is any activity that's involved uh, in selling goods and services. And the key part here is to the final consumers, which means they're not selling it to another business. They're not selling it as a, they're not acting as an intermediary business. Um, the people who they are selling to are the end users um, who are buying for their personal use. So I need a, a kind of a store that you or I would go into, but not maybe a business to business type of uh, uh, a firm or not one that is selling to uh, re, uh, primarily selling to retailers. Now, this is there's not clear lines here. You can see wholesalers or people trying to uh, blurred the line between wholesaling and retailing, and you might see also manufacturers directly selling to customers. Um, but even that's kind of, you might say, a way of approaching retailing, even when you have, let's say, a manufacturer who makes direct sales to, um, to their customers. So um, what uh, generally most retailing is done by retailers, meaning stores that are uh, primarily in the business of buying inventory and selling it to customers. But what you've seen in the last uh, few years is uh, non-store uh, non retailing, which means online sales, uh, direct mail, uh, buying through uh, phones or smartphones, um, and other types of direct sales method, uh, uh, methods. And a lot of this is because having a store requires costs. You have to pay rent on the, on the building. You have to hire more employees, perhaps. You have to provide services. Um, you can, um, uh, you know, they might not have the entire backup. Uh, they might not have the range of products in stock. And all this could lead to customer dissatisfaction. But also, I think the thing is a lot of things could go wrong um, by having, let's say, a large like physical presence because there's going to be more interactions that you can't control. Now, the reason why retailers were part of the marketing mix 
um, and why you saw kind of an expansion and people want to get their name out there is that having a store is like having a billboard. It's advertising your product um, and that can have advantages as well. And so in a previous generation, uh, you saw a lot of more store retailers and not, but certainly with the digital capabilities and platforms, the internet, uh, smartphones and things of that sort, um, it's easier for, let's say, manufacturers of a product to sell directly to customers without having the intermediaries. The other part to this is that the, advan the advantage for uh, manufacturers is that they, uh, being online allows them to collect information on their customers, which would probably only be held by people who have face-to-face -face contacts with their uh, customers. Uh, now they can see their behavior online, and therefore they can gather information, and they don't need the intermediary to kind of inform how they're, let's say, uh, presenting their product to their customers. So broad different categories by which you can um, classify retailers. Uh, you can classify them first by the amount of service they offer. Um, are they very stand back or they let the customer do all the work? Um, I'll give you some examples when we talk about that. Or are they very like hand holding where you might have a personal shopper or there might be a lot more sales associates on the floor. Um, and that might, uh, for example, if you're buying like a wedding dress or a prom dress or if you're um, uh, doing something like the wed uh, wedding organ or, uh, organizing, you're probably going to have a lot more personal, let's say, um, uh, service offered. For example, you might have like a snack section, you might uh, invite your friends over. And so the point is that there's an experience that goes with the purchase and you're not just purchasing the object or the physical product. Um, the second thing that they can be differentiated on is the breadth and depth of their product lines. So we have stores like Walmart that have a little bit of everything um, in not so much in the, our local one, but Walmart is also kind of encompassed what it would have been a grocery store in the past. Um, how many different types of products they offer, um, but also how many different uh, choices of individual products, which means they might have more than one, let's say, label uh, available in their store. So, for example, if you go into a Walmart, they're not just selling one brand of TV. They're selling a variety of different brands of TVs in their own store, and they're not selling a store brand. Uh, the third way that can be differentiated is their price point, which means you have retailers that are kind of high end. Um, they do not have discounts. They do not have sales. Uh, you have stores that are basically invitation only, which means that you cannot just walk into their, uh, their business. You have to make a prior appointment. And then you have ones that are discount retailers or um, kind of uh, everyday low prices, dollar stores, things of that sort, um, who kind of, in a sense, in their name advertise, let's say, their, their low price. Um, and lastly, there's about the organization, which means they can be franchises, uh, they can be owned by the manufacturer, they can be independent retailers, uh, they can be mixing the wholesale and the retail, um, meaning one company uh, control, owning both and, uh, uh, and things of that sort. So the different levels, whether it's in a, local, a truly local business or whether it's a national chain or whether it's a division of a larger company, um, you can think of this in terms of, let's say, um, um, automobile sales is that the manufacturers own some of the dealerships, but most dealerships are locally owned and they have some type of franchising uh, association with maybe a particular manufacturer. Although, for example, like Curry Subaru doesn't just sell Subarus, it might sell Toyotas and other brands of cars on the same line. Okay, so first of all, types of retailers dividing by the type, the amount of service they provide. So uh, self-service retailers are generally for customers who know their product very well, who are maybe more specialized, that have some expertise, or people who are willing to kind of do the research themselves. And all you have to do is provide a way to purchase it. Um, and you might see this in a lot of e-commerce sites where, uh, particularly associated with the manufacturer, where you can buy direct. Um, so I'll just give you one example of this, is that um, uh, buying pool equipment, um, I needed a filter for a particular pool vacuum. Uh, it was a replacement, uh, I, you know, you might have been able to, I was, I was able to find out what you needed, the, uh, you needed the exact models because it wasn't just like a generic filter that could fit any particular um, uh, vacuum. So um, what I did is, you know, I did a Google search. I found the actual manufacturer. Uh, they had a very low, you know, no frills type of website. I basically found it by putting in, let's say, the product code in and I found the exact match. Um, you know, this is not something that actually was easily available from something like Amazon. It was not something that I could find, um, even something like Orange County Pools, uh, where, uh, you know, they have a, a variety of different products, but probably not the one that I have in stock. And so that would be more of a self-service retailer where the locate compare select process is not done by the uh, retailer themselves, 
Um, they're not making associations. They're not making, they're not promoting particular products. Um, they're just saying, look, we have it if you need it. Um, and you can do the search uh, yourself. Um, let me just go instead of looking at limited service. Let's look at full service retailers um, that might offer more specialty goods. Um, you might have something like uh, uh, something the way you're doing like a personal shopper, or you might have a sales associate who gets commissions and deals directly uh, very different salespeople on the floor and they're getting commissions and therefore there's a high level of service. Uh, there might be extra free services provided to someone coming in, whether um, some type of token or food available, or let's say, um, uh, you know, something entertainment. Uh, so a good example of this um, uh, barbershop that I go to, it's called Just For Him. Um, and it's kind of one, it's more directed at a male clientele. But secondly about that is that um, they have, you know, TV kind of in a waiting lounge and they have uh, magazines. And instead of just getting a regular barber cut, they try to spruce it up by doing things like uh, scalp massage or whatever. But the, the point about it is that they do more than just a simple barbershop cut, uh, cut. And you can see this even in terms of like barbershops and salons in general is that they're not just that you have some ones that are very straightforward, like super cuts that are just giving you a cut and it might be a perfectly fine haircut. Um, but you might have ones where there's a social life around the uh, salon or the barbershop where people hang around, read a newspaper, have conversations. They might have a TV where a sporting event is on. They might have uh, some other type of um, uh, social activity or social organization that goes above and beyond, uh, you know, uh, just the actual the putative subject, uh, putative product that you are purchasing or service that you're purchasing. Um, so, you know, the high end is, you know, high end boutique stores uh, that might be invitation only or membership only. Um, and they might not even have their product in their store is that uh, you go in and you you have an appointment, you have a consultation, uh, you describe it, then they may go out and find something of that sort. Uh, another good example of this, I think, is real estate agents, I think, might fall into this where, um, you know, there's usually a contract and usually there's a lot of personal service, uh, um, personal service that, although obviously they don't own the, um, the properties themselves. Um, and then in the middle, you have some type of limited service retailers, which means that uh, they might have a physical presence and an online presence. They might uh, carry, uh, provide information or details. So you might, um, um, you know, Home Depot might be a good example of something that's between limited service and full service, meaning that they might provide, let's say, tutorials or workshops on how to do different types of jobs. Uh, they're expected maybe to give advice about how to do a particular job or what type of uh, materials that you might need to do a particular project in your home. Uh, they might, uh, you might be able to call in for a, con a free in-home consultation uh, for installation or some type of service of that, um, but they're not necessarily um, always hand-holding. So there's kind of a combination of some sales assistance, but not complete sales assistance. So a second way to uh, differentiate retailers is by uh, what product assortment that's available in their store. So you can have very narrowly specialty stores. So something like Radio Shack, which only sells electronics, um, that is a narrow product line and, uh, you know, in that area, uh, a very deep assortment versus like a supermarket or department store where you're going to have a variety of different things like Macy's or um, perhaps um, JCPenney, where you have clothing, home furnishings, household goods. And just the name of the department store indicates that there's very different different departments um, that are kind of really different types of different arrays of products being sold to you. Um, and you might even have variety within, let's say you're not just selling household goods, but you're selling a variety of different labels of household goods. Um, a supermarket um, is you may, a store that obviously focuses on food and groceries, um, although that's changed. I think most grocery stores now sell a lot of like more home goods and they're more a little bit kind of uh, shading into what a department store might have covered in the past. But I think the key thing about a supermarket is that it's usually a uh, low cost, low margin, which means supermarkets are all about saving money um, and in a way that's not always true about department stores um, and being uh, in a sense, low margin, which means they don't make a lot of money on their sales. So very often supermarkets are about selling volume. So if you go to a produce section or a meat section, um, it's not the same thing as a green grocer. It's not the same thing as a butcher shop. Um, but the point is that they're going to have a volume. They're going to try to sell a volume because they're not making a lot of money on the individual sale of products. So for example, if something is sold for 99 cents, 
Uh, their cost is probably pretty close to 99 cents. It's not, um, they're not gonna make a huge profit margin on a lot of their sales. Um, they make their uh, profit by um, the volume of sales. So one a good example of this is Kroger's, which is um, uh, a supermarket that's very common in the Midwest. Uh, basically what you see is, you know, lower prices, constant sales, usually seasonal sales for things like produce and meat, uh, cut prices and, and, and try to kind of um, uh, increase volume by, by keeping prices low and, and having a variety of different things. So that the idea is that when you go into a grocery store, you might go in for one thing like milk or eggs or something like that. And then while you're shopping, you see other things on sale, such as oranges or grapes or some other type of produce, some uh, frozen foods, uh, ice cream treats or things of that sort. Um, and then you purchase more than what you went in, uh, what you went in with a plan to purchase. Um, some other ways is that you have convenience stores. Now, convenience stores, what is key about them is the high turnover, which means that Convenience stores don't try to stock everything, um, but they're not specializing in a particular area, uh, which means like there's not just one thing, like in a Radio Shack, but what you get there is a high turnover. So the things that are sold in convenience stores uh, generally are things that uh, fly out the door. So uh, beverages would be one example of them. Um, uh, you know, bread, snacks, uh, not necessarily food staples, but things that are quick to you know grab and go. Um, gum would be another good example of this. Um, so the thing is that people who are not going on shopping trips that maybe usually convenience stores are passed with, uh, paired with gas stations, which means you're there to get gas, but while you're in there, you might grab something that a small something that you need. So impulse buys or um, uh, convenience goods. And then of course you have kind of what are greater than department stores, but you're seeing growing and growing are the super stores such as Target, Walmart, um, and Best Buy, where you see these really large big box stores and these large shopping centers that often have, you know, associated with big parking lots, um, which means that people drive from a distance to go there um, and they offer the full assortment. Um, not so much our Walmart, but Walmart is not just a, a you know, department store very often. Uh, Walmart is the premier grocery store as well um, and food and non-food items. So a lot of these, um, you know, or category killers are these ones that don't seem to fit into one of your categories. So if you have a specialty store that's particularly narrow, um, but it's very large, I think uh, the ones that fit this the best are things like Dick's Sporting Goods would be an example of a very large store, but a very narrow, like say uh, a, a product line, or in a sense, like a very narrow, let's say, focus on what, what types of things it sells. Uh, Cabela's, which is like a hunting goods uh, store, would be good, another good example of that. Something that's a very large chain, very large stores, but very focused on a particular, let's say, customer clientele, which means that a lot of people might never ever go to Cabela's, and some people might never go to the Dick's Sporting Goods, um, but they may, they, they're they able to maintain uh, a large volume with a very defined uh, customer base. Now, the third one, uh, one is by the uh, price point, and, um, which means uh, we've talked about these types of stores. Um, the first one is discount stores, which means there's an everyday low price, um, very low price, low margins, high volume. So anything with dollar in its name, Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, um, Dollar General would be kind of discount stores where they're, you know, in a sense that everything is cheap, but the idea is that you're gonna buy a lot of cheap things and that and you probably will buy things because of the price, even though you don't need them. Um, another good example of something that would be what are off-price retailers, which means that uh, they are buying merchandise um, at a discount and then they are selling it to you. So this could be things with like overstock, it could be um, uh, irregular or like things that don't make the standard for the primary retailer, leftovers from previous seasons, uh, particularly with clothing stores. And I think the ones you see the most common are things like Marshalls, Home Goods, um, AJ Wright's, TJ Maxx. Um, which basically buy, you know, uh, more narrower like clothing and home good lines. And what they do is they sell them kind of at a discount, uh, but there's less of an organization and they don't have, let's say, a fixed inventory. So while you have, let's say, departments within, let's say, a Marshalls or a Home Goods or a TJ Maxx, um, it's never very clear what they have in their inventory at any given time. Where if you were walking into a Kohl's, they have very defined sections and they have different 
let's say, uh, patterned clothing, tops, et cetera, for different seasons. Um, and even though they might have a clearance section as well, um, that's not their primary way uh, of making sales. Um, some other type of off-price retailers, so independent off-price retailers, you know, are um, uh, independently owned. So I was, uh, stores that are, um, you know, there used to be a lot more of them in the area, but things like there used to be a store called Odd Jobs. Um, there used to be one called, um, it was in the Beach Shopping Center, Peekskill, but basically bought discounted merchandise. Um, Big Lots, I think, would be a good example of something like this, where Big Lots is its own chain, but they don't sell their own merchandise necessarily. They, they sell a lot of things that is kind of re, resold or repurchased at a discount. Um, some other types of uh, off-price retailers would be factory outlets. So these gen generally tend to be manufacturer owned. So you have factory outlets very often in um, old, you might call Rust Belt towns. So Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, I think Reading, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, where you might just have a lot of factory outlets. Um, in some ways, the Woodbury Commons are factory outlets combined with boutique stores. Um, and the idea is that they're manufacturer owned and they are direct to, direct to the customer. Um, I mentioned in a previous video lecture about um, bakery outlets that sell, uh, you know, direct from the bakeries that are franchised, but things that they can, uh, when they overbake or a particular um, uh, particular item, what they do is instead of, you know, sending it to a grocery store or to a deli, um, they just kind of sell it at a cut rate at, um, through their own outlet. Um, warehouse clubs, things like BJ's, Costco's, um, uh, uh, Sam's Club, et cetera, where maybe you have a membership and things are kind of put on a pallet. There's not a lot of service. There's not a lot of, let's say, flair to it. Um, but the idea is that there's a kind of a, a sale of bulk. Um, the facility is basically sometimes even deliberately made to look like a warehouse. So the idea is that you're going in, there's no frills, you're not getting a lot of service, um, but you're able to buy things in bulk uh, at a cheaper price. Um, so different ways of organizing retailers. So you have, uh, you know, corporate chain stores. So this would be a store that is owned or controlled uh, by a particular uh, company. Um, so uh, Target would be a good example of this. Um, um, uh, manufacturers, Apple store, things of that sort. Um, so the point is that they're, they're legally part of the same company and they have their own merchandise and they have their own business model where a voluntary chain might be a, a bunch of independent sellers. So you might find this with delis or farmers markets where um, they gather together to source their, uh, their source their inventory together um, and for buying and merchandising, but they don't, um, they're not, they're, they act independent, they're independently owned. Um, and therefore, you know, the prices in one store don't have to be coordinated with the prices in another store. Um, but you basically band together to provide wholesale services. Um, something you don't see as much, at least in this area, are cooperatives, which means that um, uh, they get, they get, um, you see this sometimes for buying local produce. Um, you see, I've, my experience with cooperatives, I've seen them a lot more in Japan and in Europe than I find them in the United States, um, where uh, a central buying organization sources their sources their uh, their goods or their products, um, and then they also uh, sometimes advertise together um, in certain maybe under the same name, even though they are separately owned. And lastly, you have a franchise organization, which means that. Uh, as I said, this, a good example of this would be um, something like auto dealerships, locally owned, uh, but branded with the uh, manufacturer or the, 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 the maker, uh, the make of the car. So uh, it might be a Toyota, Subaru, Chevy, Ford, et cetera. Uh, but the actual dealership is not owned by the manufacturer. The so I'm going to switch a little bit and talk about um, marketing, uh, retail marketing strategies. And I think that the key thing here is that uh, retail is a business. You have the marketing mix for retailers. It's not just in the sense they're the place part of the marketing mix for manufacturers. So you have, you know, you have to decide what kind of products and what type of services you want to sell, what price point you have, um, how you are going to promote it so that you have like local ads that are kind of sourced to the retailer. So Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, grocery stores, et cetera, have their own local ads, um, but they're not promoting a particular, it's not, let's say, the maker of their individual products you might find. So if you're talking about Home Depot, it won't be like Ryobi or Makita or Rigid or something like that, but they'll give a local ad 
that's based on their store. Um, and based on that, stores have to choose, they have to uh, segment and target different, um, different parts of the market um, and differentiate themselves uh, from, from, from their competitors as well, because uh, you might have a Kohl's, but there's other types of, let's say, uh, clothing stores that might be competitors. Uh, Walmart versus Kmart, uh, Walmart versus Target. Um, and we've talked about that before, so I won't go on to it uh, as much anymore, other than to, to talk about the Target Walmart distinction is that Walmart always focused on price, everyday low prices, while Target was more about quality. And as we discussed in the past, this has changed a little bit over time. Um, so the first thing that they have to do is, you know, segment and target the market. And, um, uh, you know, who do I want to sell to? What are the different, um, different parts of the market? Um, the easiest way to see these are ones that are kind of price differentiated, so, or, or segmenting based on price. So um, where you have, let's say, the dollar stores, dollar general, family dollar, dollar tree, versus, let's say, maybe something like Saks Fifth Avenue, something that's kind of a high brand, Macy's, et cetera. Um, that they're picking different price points to appeal to different demographics. And as we've discussed in the past, that um, it's really the ones in the middle, uh, things like Sears and Kmart that have really suffered. If the luxury stores and retailers have done relatively well, uh, the discount retailers have done relatively well. Um, and this kind of reflects the growing trend toward inequality in terms of society. Um, and therefore kind of, while in the past, the, um, the uh, middle class slash uh, middle price uh, retailer would have been the bread and butter or the, the place that you wanted to be. So Sears is a, a very huge presence, did much better than let's say either the luxury or the dollar stores in the past. Um, they have been getting pretty much killed in the current marketing environment. I think partly because they're the most vulnerable to uh, online retailers, which means that uh, uh, online retailers don't really compete that much with uh, high-end luxury goods because people who have that much money are not going to, don't want to actually go and do the search themselves online or buy things. Um, they like the personal service that usually comes with high-end luxury retail, so they've kind of differentiated their product. Um, and this is not just in a sense high-end fashion, but it could be something like, you know, Whole Foods, etc., where people like to have the experience of shopping. Um, they're not just getting the goods. And then you have kind of, let's say, the people who are looking for bargains that there's fewer bargains when you buy online because everything is visible. I can see all the different alternatives. I can see who's the, the high and low cost sellers. Um, but if I try to do bargain shopping, you know, that means I have to put more time in to see who's having a sale in a particular store. Um, and also I think the immediacy that even with, you know, same day delivery that Amazon is starting to promote, um, there are many times where I needed something now and had to be able to find it. and um, the low end, re the low end dollar, dollar tree, et cetera, have been more um, convenient to me than let's say uh, buying something online. While the things that are generally in, you know, um, you know, middle of the road retail, you don't need it immediately. You don't necessarily want the services that might be associated with it. Um, you just want the product, and the most convenient way for the product is not to go out and drive to deal with other shoppers, but to go online and buy it from an online retailer like Amazon. Um, so some examples of this, uh, one good example is Whole Foods. Um, I think Whole Foods is interesting because it's kind of gone the opposite way of Walmart. Well, Walmart went for big everything. They went for low prices. They went for, um, you know, uh, cheap. Whole Foods basically went the opposite of Walmart. So the point is, is that the areas that Walmart wanted to take over, which are mostly uh, lower middle class um, consumers, uh, Whole Foods kind of targeted it like upper middle class and wealthy consumers by, in a sense, it's a grocery store, but it's a grocery store that has higher prices. It has, let's say, higher quality uh, merchandise. Um, it is located generally in more affluent areas. Um, we don't have as many Whole Foods in this area, but a good example of this in Dutchess and Orange County is something called Adams Fair Acre uh, Farms, which is kind of, uh, I want to say, a high end um, you know, grocery store, Turco's might be another example of not so much of a, of a chain, but a local store that kind of emulates this model, which is that um, we are not providing you with the cheapest prices. We're not, in a sense, giving you the most selection, but we're providing you a, a lot of service. And particularly for people who have uh, larger and greater incomes, uh, 
they might focus on this. The other thing with whole foods is that with the concern with organic and, you know, uh, pesticides and foods and things of that sort, uh, whole foods has kind of focused itself on being natural and, and high quality. And therefore, what, you know, convincing people what they're paying for is a higher quality um, uh, rather than, let's say, the exclusivity of the store. Um, so the marketing mix, I won't go over this, we've talked about this um, ad um, infinitum, you know, product, price, promotion, location. Um, retailers have to pick this, like where they want to locate their stores. Um, and um, some of these I think are relatively straightforward, so let me just focus on the last one, location. Um, obviously retailers are the location, like when people choose a retailer, they're partially choosing the location or the platform that they're, that they're selling their product on. But I think that not all retailers are the same in terms of where they choose to locate their stores. Um, so a good example of this that I've mentioned before is um, A&P, um, a grocery store that no longer um, is in, I believe, no longer is in existence, that it was completely bought out. But A&P was the first, let's say, chain store, national chain store um, over 100 years ago. Um, but they were much smaller and they were mostly located in cities and they were based on the model where people would walk to the store um, basically, their locations were chosen prior to automobiles, um, um, for the most part. And so what they set up is relatively small stores, probably the size of a, a CVS pharmacy or something of that size. Um, and so what happened with them is that they were located, one, in declining areas, urban areas where the populations were declining, but also um, they didn't have enough floor space to provide, to be a competitor to a super stop and shop or... Um, uh, you know, ShopRite, which has kind of always expanded and, and gone for larger and larger and bigger footprints on uh, on their store on their store's uh, location. Um, so, part of the uh, the marketing mix is that what types of products do you want um, that that differentiate from, let's say, you know, uh, from from your competitors, but also ones that are going to match what your expectations are. So when I uh, in terms of, because I will mention Home Depot here, when you took at, let's say, um, an Ace True Value hardware store versus Home Depot, um, what you generally find is that a true, uh, Ace True Value focuses on having, I don't know, I would say like more specialized and kind of higher quality tools and products, but also ones that are focused on particular users, while Home Depot has kind of a standardized selection that is kind of overwhelming. In some senses, like they have a little, a lot of everything. Um, so very often, like uh, I won't, I rather go to the Ace True Value hardware store when I'm shopping. Uh, but very often, I don't find either the quantity. So for large products where I'm buying building materials, or I don't find uh, the, um, they don't have every single thing under the under the sun. Which means if I'm looking for something very specialized, uh, that is not something that's used very often. Um, I don't expect to find it there, but I would find it in, um, you know, a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Uh, there's different mixes. So how uh, I would mention before, Home, Home Depot provides a lot of clinics or how-to classes. Uh, and I've talked before about Home Depot kind of as a split store where half of it's oriented toward uh, professional contractors and half of it's oriented toward um, do-it-yourselfers. And I think that they change their, their, their shares of the mix depending on what's happening in the economy. Uh, when the economy is going up, you tend to see contractors doing more business as people are hiring other people to do renovations. When the economy is going down, uh, they do more uh, fi uh, fix-it-yourself and do-it-yourself uh, do types of uh, projects. Um, store atmosphere. So, you know, there's a lot of design that goes in, particularly, let's say, boutiques in malls. Um, an Apple store in the Jefferson Valley Mall looks like an Apple store everywhere else in the world. Um, if you're going to a high end, you might even do things where they have uh, smells or uh, mood mu music to go with it. Um, if you're going into something that is less frilly, uh, kind of the the bare nature of it, um, even though it seems to be they're doing less, is kind of setting the idea that uh, we're not spending a lot on decorations and therefore you know you're getting lower prices. Um, and this adds to the experience of shopping and, you know, most people find shopping very stressful. They find it as a task to do. Um, and so if you're making shopping a, a, a better experience, uh, people might buy from you just uh, to go in that. Probably I think the, um, there are stores I think that are primarily about window shopping. And the one that I'm thinking most of is something called FAO Schwartz, which is a toy store in New York City. 
uh, people like to go in and just play with the toys or just see what the new, uh, yeah, you know, it's almost like a little bit of a wonderland. And it's not necessarily for people to go in, find something, make a quick purchase and get out. But the whole idea is to go to the store and see kind of uh, store displays. Um, particularly, I think, in New York City, where you, um, Madison Avenue, where they put a lot of attention into the window displays. That they um, uh, It's partly to create that experience. Um, kind of some other examples of experience, uh, Cabela's, which is a Texas uh, kind of sporting goods slash hunting type of company. Um, they, uh, it's not just in the sense that they have experts on the floor, or they have a variety of different merchandise. Um, it's that they make it almost a museum. So you're going to see like, you know, the taxidermy, the stuffed animals here and there for people to kind of uh, hunting. Uh, you might have um, aquariums for fishing. Uh, you might have, um, in the sense that it's, it's more like a quasi museum shopping experience rather than just going, you know, shelves of product that you go in, you buy, and you go out to the register. Um, just talking a little bit about setting the mood or the look. Um, so this is a Sony store. Um, you might also see these. I think this is very similar to what you might find in an Apple store. Uh, very modern, very clean lines, uh, low lighting. Uh, once again, electronics and visibility, uh, color, music, uh, even smell. So the point is, and really I think that Bath and Body Works would be a good example of this, where they're they're subtly affecting, like you you're you walk in and you get a, an aroma around you, rather than just in a sense, um, you know, kind of get the sterile kind of hospital clean sense that some, that other stores uh, try to do. Um, something that is relatively straightforward. Uh, we talked about price point, and I think this is that you either have kind of a luxury where um, you everything is very, very expensive. Um, and the idea is that if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Um, and you have these luxury stores that would never offer discounts or sales because even though they would, might increase their volume of sales, they would kind of damage their brand. And then you have stores that are like everyday low prices, which means there's constant sales, constant promotions, um, whether they're seasonal promotions or they're um, overstock and things of that sort. Um, and the idea is that you want us to fit your overall, let's say, brand and how you're positioning yourself in the market. Uh, so kind of on the high end, uh, Vision uh, Boutiques, um, it's, it's on Rodeo Drive, an exclusive kind of shopping zone in Beverly Hills. Um, you can also find this certainly um, in Midtown Manhattan type of uh, retail. Uh, appointment only means that you don't just walk into a store. Uh, you call ahead and, you know, they clear the store for you and you have kind of a personal shopping experience. And partly that's because what they're selling is so expensive. Um, you know, even if they make one sale uh, for an ostrich, ostrich skin vest, um, you know, that pays, pays the bills for the day. Um, and so these are people going to target, let's say, concentrations of great wealth. So uh, people in finance, people in uh, the tech sector, people in uh, celebrities, uh, media, et cetera, uh, where they're just um, operating on a different level of income um, and wealth. Um, so I think that um, the Ginza in, in Tokyo would be kind of a similar type of a shopping experience or the stores there. So the last one is um, where you locate. And um, this is kind of partially a change in the urbanization location. Um, it used to be that central business districts, the main street or Broadway um, of the city was where most of the commerce was located. Um, this kind of assumed a pre-automobile world where people walked in or rode into the, the store and you had a sh central shopping district. So several different things happened with this. The first one obviously is the advent of the automobile and the building of highways um, that kind of, and also the lack of parking in the downtowns of cities. Uh, made it very hard for people to go to central business districts. Um, another part of this that sometimes is not um, as clear um, is that it avoids boycotts, um, and particularly in the response to the civil rights movement in the 1960s, where you had um, the sit-ins and other types of protest on the main street. Um, it was a lot more effective to do that when you had a central business district that was all in one area and your, your customers would not come. And also because you were concentrated, it was very visible, which made the boycotts effective. Um, it's what made the sit-ins effective is that um, they weren't just boycotting, they were boycotting in a visible way. 
Um, it's a lot harder to do when people are in large shopping malls and, you know, the boycott of the protesters are kind of huddled to one side or it's not on a public street where they can protest, i.e. a sidewalk, um, that you're on private property and therefore it's harder to make that message. Um, I think there was part of that decision to make it harder for um, uh, cause-related uh, boycotts and protests to occur um, at retailers. Um, so what you've seen a lot more uh, is things like regional shopping centers. So um, the Cortland Town Center would be one of them, Jefferson Valley Mall, Poughkeepsie Galleria, um, with, uh, Danbury, where you have a whole uh, series of uh, retailing chains all located in the same place, usually with lots of parking, um, large commercial centers. Um, and you can contrast that with maybe like a community shopping center that might be um, smaller. So the uh, the A and P Plaza across from Lakeland High School would be a good example of something that has uh, a more limited. Uh, there's shopping there. Um, there's a variety of different stores um, and restaurants and things of that sort. Uh, but it's certainly not as large as let's say the Cortland Town Center would be. And then you have things like strip malls, which are kind of maybe about five or six uh, stores, kind of in a very classic you know front. Uh, limited parking up front, but basically just a square. Um, so something that was just mentioned before, central businesses were the main form of a retail cluster until the 1950s, the advent of the automobile, the construction of highways, and also I think the avoidance of you know protests and uh, the civil rights movement and boycotts uh, basically meant central business have mostly been hollowed out. Um, and there's, uh, so. You've seen kind of two paths on this. The first one is what I think if you went to Kingston or Newburgh or even Peekskill, the main the main commercial drag, uh, their Broadway or their Main Street, um, has basically been hollowed out. Um, it's kind of become a ghost town. We can see a lot of empty uh, empty storefronts. Um, but what I think you've seen increasingly is kind of a gentrification, which means that you don't have so much retailers, but you have a lot more. Um, services, massage parlors, tattoo parlors, um, small restaurants. Um, so uh, Beacon would be a good example of this, which has kind of renovated its downtown. Um, there's some other quote unquote river towns that have kind of gone on this model by uh, reinventing their central business district um, to be more about, you know, people who want pedestrian friendly. And you've even seen this kind of a, a little bit in the change of how malls are constructed. Um, so. Um, uh, gosh, uh, down in Yonkers, the uh, the Ridge Center, they kind of created a small little village where um, instead of having like a mall, which you all have a central gallery and you all the boutiques are off that um, internal gallery, they've created like, kind of like a small city block to kind of simulate shopping in Manhattan. Uh, you've also seen this in uh, Nanuet Mall, which was uh, basically the same exact construction as the Jefferson Valley Mall, where what they did is they knocked out the central galleria, kept their two anchor stores on either end, like create a kind of like like a drive-through pedestrian sidewalk friendly experience, which means you drive there, you go in a parking lot, and then you walk through kind of let's say a small little village of stores. Um, Woodbury Commons might also be kind of another example of something like this, where uh, you go there, you're in a parking lot, but then you kind of walk down a promenade of a bunch of boutique stores where it's mostly facing outside as opposed to facing an interior galleria. Uh, Shopping centers, uh, we have a lot of those. So Cortland Town Center would be a good example of one of them. Uh, Jefferson Valley Mall would still probably be considered a shopping center, even though it's more of a mall. Um, regional shopping centers just means that, uh, I, I mean, Cortland Town Center is sort of this way, but I don't really think it's as large as what you might find in some other areas. So um, around the Newburgh area, Union Avenue, uh, Middletown, I think you tend to see these more where you see the intersection of highways and therefore people are coming from a long distance. Um, Westchester is a little bit too dense to kind of support uh, and the property values are too high to have, let's say, a, a, what you might call a true regional shopping center. Uh, but I think the best example of this is that if you drove to Middletown where you have the throughway I-84 I and 17 all crossing together is that you drive into Middletown and mostly what you see are the large shopping centers and you don't you really don't even see the city itself. Um, and because most people are basically driving through on a highway, getting off on an exit, uh, not actually going to the city, avoiding the central uh, uh, the downtown, um, et cetera. So community shopping centers, I've talked about this previously. Um, 
Portland Town Center is sort of on the line between these two different things where it's fewer stores. Um, it probably has one dominant store, obviously the Portland Town Center, that would be Walmart, um, and to a lesser extent now shop right across the street. Um, and limited, let's say, specialty stores or friendly shoppings in between. Uh, neighborhood shopping centers, the AP Plaza, um, the Acme Plaza across from Lakeland. Um, what has happened is that um, I think that in is that people go shopping less and less. Uh, so it's gone down from something that would happen every week to something, let's say, it becomes every other week or once a month. Um, and the number of trips, but also the length of the, the time spent shopping has decreased. So um, what you see, particularly in the renovation of downtowns, is that you've seen creating shopping centers as experiences. So the point is that it might be attached to a historical district. They might be combined with entertainment, such as a movie theater more often. Uh, they might have a kind of um, a place to be seen, which means large, large kind of walking areas outside, parks associated with them. Um, it's not just simply as functional as, let's say, a large like um, asphalt parking lot with hundreds and hundreds of cars, and then you go into the main entrance. Um, the Woodbury Commons is probably the best example of this in our, in our area. So that's it for right now. This is the end of this video lecture. In the next video lecture, we're going to look at some more like demographic and you know secular trends that are affecting retailing and take a closer look at wholesaling that, uh, than we did today. So I'll see you next time. And that's it for now.